Thank you very much. Off we go. We are now being recorded. All right. So it's about 12. We usually wait a couple minutes before we, people seem to sign on right at the last minute. So, uh, which is what I would do if I wasn't hosting, honestly. So uh, we usually start a minute or two late. So we'll wait and see if we get a final burst of participants here. So we'll be starting in just a minute or two. Hey everyone, we'll be starting in about a minute or two. We're getting that sort of last minute burst of uh, people. The count just shot up by 30 in the last 20 seconds or so. So once we start to level out here, we'll get started. Maybe one more minute. All right, great, uh, let's get started. So hi everybody, this is Jason Key at SB Grid at Harvard Medical School. Thanks for joining. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. So uh, be sure to check our schedule for our, our webinars. We'll send out emails as well, but uh, the webinars are there. They're available to anybody who wants to join. And uh, we've got a, a good schedule going forward for the next uh, month or so. We've got um, Daniel Panna from uh, Leicester is gonna be on April 17th. We've got Pablo Canesa about Cypion. That's coming up in on the 21st. Sean Zeng, motion correction, UCSF. Um, Kai Diedrichs, XDS. Uh, Deborah Marks for EV couplings. Colin Palmer for CCPM. So, and, and more. So be sure to keep, uh, keep up to I just put the link in the chat. So uh, you can take a look at that and keep track of everything that's, uh, that's coming up. Uh, if you have questions during the talk, you can go ahead and put those in the chat and we can get them as, uh, as we go. Uh, you can raise your hand and we can unmute your mic. Otherwise, keep your mic muted as we, as we go. Uh, these will be recorded and on our SB Grid TV YouTube channel. So uh, if you want to rewatch or catch a bit of it or send it on to a colleague, feel free. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll kick it off. So today we've got uh, Dorothy Liebschner who is uh, joining us from Berkeley, who's gonna talk about uh, map sharpening. So Dorothy, go right ahead. My presentation is about map sharpening, model building, and other cryo-EM tools in Phoenix. So it's the third presentation about Phoenix tools for cryo-EM. And um, before I start, I just wanted to uh, mention, this is my very first webinar, so um, I hope it works all well, and please bear with me. So, <clears throat> I want to start with an overview of the structure solution workflow in CryoEM. So first we do our experiment, we get some images, and from these images we get reduced data, which is a CryoEM map. And so where Phoenix kicks in <clears throat> is when we have that CryoEM map, which represents the electrostatic potential. And the first step we want to do with that map is to see how good are the experimental data. So we want to do data quality assessment of that map. 
Then we want to improve this map possible. So we want to do perform map optimization. And once we have the best possible map, we want to get a model that fits the data. So we can do this by fitting or automatic model building. Once we have an atomic model, we want to improve it and determine its quality. And to do that, we do the refinement, rebuilding, validation cycle. And once we have the best possible model from the procedure, we can move on and deposit the model. So for each of these steps, there are tools in fix. So for data quality assessment, we have M triage, optimized alteration densification. For fitting, there's rigid model docking. For automatic model building, there's map to model. And for the refinement validation, we have space refined comprehensive validation. So these are the main tools, but we also have a couple of, let's say, smaller tools which do some tasks which are not necessarily associated to one uh, of these pro processes, but they can be used throughout the whole uh, workflow. So there could be map symmetry, map box, and apply NCS operators. So I want to show how you can uh, get to these tools for CryEM in Phoenix. So this is a screenshot of the Phoenix GUI. So on the left-hand side, you have a list of projects, and the project that is currently selected has the green check mark. And if you go to this job history tab, you can see a list of all the jobs which have been run in this project. So the left-hand side here is for bookkeeping. And on the right-hand side, you have a list of available Phoenix tools, and they are arranged by category. And because we have now many CryoEM tools available, we have its the own category for CryoEM. So if you click on this um, category, um, then now the uh, list of uh, programs is available. So you can see there's uh, quite a lot of tools which we have uh, here. So to put what I will be talking today into perspective with uh, the talks from Tom Terwilliger last Tuesday and Pavel Afrunin last Friday, um, I want to remind what they uh, were presenting. So Tom Terwilliger talked about density modification and Pavel Afonin talked about real space with fine and comprehensive validation, and probably also touched about a data quality, quality assessment with m -triage. So I will be talking about auto sharpen, rigid model docking, and map to model, and I will also go briefly over map symmetry and map box. So let's start with the uh, map tools. I would like to talk now about auto sharpen. So, we have uh, several map tools available in Phoenix. And in general, the goal of these map tools is to get the best possible map facility sequence. Subsets are, as we have seen in the overview, model building and refinement. So we want to get clear maps and we want to have maps that are easy to build a model into. So one, these are clear maps, and we can get clearer maps by using the automated map sharpening and by using density motion. And we can get maps which are maybe easy to build onto by using symmetry and motion. And so we'll start with map sharp. So the principle of map sharp is just to depend on map to map clear. And we will do this by reducing the contribution of high noise. So we can consider map as a, a sum of Fourier coefficients, and we will apply a resolution dependent scale factor to these Fourier coefficients. If this scale factor, we just call it here B sharpen, is larger than zero, then the amplitudes will increase at high resolution. That means we will sharpen the map. If the sharpening factor is smaller than zero, that means the amplitudes will decrease at high resolution and we will blur the map. So if you want to see the details of this procedure, you can look at Tom's paper where he describes map sharpening in detail. So here I only want to give some overall concepts. So in the next slide, I want to show a video. 
So I move to this slide and I actually want to stop it because I want to give a couple of comments before uh, things start moving. So here's the little movie. So we have a density which and we have a model built into that density. And so the aim of this video is um, showing how the appearance of the map changes as a function of the overall B factor. So the overall B factor is shown in the top right here. So just look at the B factor and keep in mind how the map changes. So the B factor will increase first to 300 and then it will go down to minus 100 and then it will repeat this again. So we can have actually a chance to see what's going on. Okay, so the video starts, we increase, the density becomes blurred. was disconnected. So many people go up again. So we have a blurred map of these peaks. And here we just finish again at 20. So in this slide, I just want to show the two extremes. We have a high isotropic B factor applied, and then we have this tube-shaped density. So we have high connectivity, but we also have few details. So probably here it's easy to see how the main chain um, moves or where the helices are, but it's very difficult to decide how the side chains are oriented or where the side chains actually are located. On the other hand, if we have a, a, a negative value for the overall B factor, then we have low connectivity. That means we have lots of separate peaks that are not connected but we also have maybe lots of detail. So we are maybe now able to how, somehow guess how the side chains are oriented. But it's also difficult to decide, to, to decide where actually the side chain is and where the main chain is. So map sharpening tries to find the best compromise between connectivity and detail. And um, this is how it's done. The approach for map sharpening is to look at a value called the adjusted surface area. So let's see what that is. So we will create a series of maps for different overall B values. That's a little bit like in that video we just looked at. So we had for each B value, we had a map. And then we will analyze each of these maps for detail and connectivity. So in order to be able to compare these maps, we have to choose a certain contour level. So we will set the contour level such that it will enclose 20% of the molecular volume. This way we can compare all these different maps. And then we will calculate some values. First, we will calculate the surface area of the contours. The surface area represents the connectivity. If we have a high if the surface area is large, then we have a lot of um, peaks, so we have um, low connectivity. And on the other hand, if the surface area is small, that means we have just one big blob and then the connectivity is large. The second uh, value we will calculate is the number of distinct regions enclosed by the contours. So how many peaks do we have? If we have lots of peaks, we have lots of detail. If we just have a few peaks, then we have fewer details. And then we will combine this. We will say the adjusted surface area is the surface area minus a weighting term times the number of regions. And then we choose that map that has the maximum of the adjusted surface area as the sharpened map. And so let's um, illustrate why we are doing this. So here we have on the y-axis uh, arbitrary scales for the adjusted surface area represented by these squares, the surface area, which is uh, this red curve here, and the number of regions, which is this blue curve here. And on the x-axis, we have the, Wilson, uh, the uh, overall B factor. So it ranges from minus 100 to 300, like in that video we just watched. And so again, if we have 
high beam value. Remember, we have the tube-shaped density, so we have high connectivity, but few details. And at the same time, the surface area will be small and we will only have a few regions. So we will have low values for these two quantities. If we have a negative B factor, then we will have lots of details. We have lots of peaks and we have a low connectivity. And the surface area will be larger and the number of regions will be larger. Now, if we look at the shape of these curves, both are monotonically de um, decreasing. So if we just look at each of these curves in um, isolation, it's very difficult to say, oh, here the surface area is the best or the number of regions is the best. So this is the reason why we will combine these two quantities for the adjusted surface area. And because the adjusted surface area has a shape such that it has a maximum in between these two extreme values. So, so the maximum here is about 20, and that corresponds to the uh, um, best map which we saw in the video. So here's an example of the map sharpening, how uh, dramatically it can change the clarity of a map. So on the left, you have a deposited map in the EMDB uh, database. If you open this map just like that, it will look have this uh, shape. And so you can only see density uh, representing the main chain of the helix. And maybe there are some bumps for the side chains, um, but it's not clear how these side chains are really oriented. When we apply the sharpening procedure, so we maximize the adjusted surface area of the map, we get the map on the right. And this map is much clearer. We can see now density for the side chains. And um, I think, uh, so I would feel much more confident for placing this model into the density than here on the left. So this is about map sharpening. Once we have a clear map with the map sharpening procedure, we can move on to the next step. So in, um, let me first uh, show how to run actually the auto sharpen uh, tutorial. So in order to run the tutorials in the Phoenix GUI, you go to new project and then you have here a new window that appears and you click on this button in the, uh, button in the bottom, which is called setup tutorial data. Click okay and you have yet another little window that is called tutorial setup. And here you can choose in the drop down menu uh, the tutorial data. So for auto sharpen map, you can choose major cap C protein of group A rotavirus. Then you can choose a destination and it's hidden now, but there's also a button called read me. If you click that button on how to run the tutorial. So if you forget to click that button, that's not a problem because that text file is also in the directory with the tutorial data that you just create um, with this procedure here. So you can still look at that text file by going to the directory. So let's say we choose uh, this auto sharpen map tutorial and then we go to the auto sharpen uh, GUI and this is, um, I will show you now which uh, parameters we have to put in in order to run auto sharpen. So essential to run it are the map file and the resolution. And it's always recommended to give a job title to any of your runs so you can see in a couple of months or weeks um, what actually you were doing when you were running AutoSharpen uh, tool. So once we run the AutoSharpen uh, program, we will, the output is a sharpened map file. So you can choose the name or you can leave the uh, default name, which is here. And hopefully you can get from an initial map that is not so clear to a sharpened map, which has uh, more clarity and which can be used for further steps. So now I want to talk about map symmetry and map segmentation. <coughs> map segmentation. So um, it may happen that the uh, samples used for the experiment have symmetry, uh, have symmetry and so the cryo-M maps may also have some symmetry. And 
If this is the case, it is more efficient to work with the unique part of a map. So here's an example. This shows um, a view of the Gruel um, density at 3.5 angstrom resolution. And just by looking at it by eye, we can see that there seems to be some sort of symmetry. So if we count the number of these little density parts, which protrude from that uh, round area, then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there seems to be a sevenfold symmetry around a central axis. And here in orange is shown now the unique part of this map. And now to obtain this unique part, it's a two-step process. We use two tools to get this unique part. The first one is called map symmetry. And to run map symmetry, here's a screenshot of the GUI, you only need a map file and the resolution. If you uh, already know the symmetry, you can actually um, give this information. And then the program will run and will give a file with symmetry operators. So this is not yet the unique part of the map. In order to get the unique part of the map, we have to move to another program. So in our like, example of the Groyal map, we have 14 symmetry operators because we have the sevenfold symmetry along this axis and we have twice this uh, domain uh, with the sevenfold symmetry. So we have 14 operators. Now to get the unique part of the map, we use a tool called map box. And this tool can identify the regions that represent the asymmetric unit of the map. And it will do it this way. Here's again the, um, the screenshot of the GUI. We need a map file and we need um, to tell the program the symmetry. So I forgot to put um, the um, orange uh, box around it, but you also need a symmetry file. You need the resolution and you have to give some options to tell Mapbox what it ex exactly has to do. So we want Mapbox in this case to extract the unique part of the map. So Mapbox can do uh, some other things as well. Let's say if you have a model and a map, it can also extract the part of a map around a particular part of the model, let's say around a helix. So this is why this GUI is a little bit more complicated and has more options. So once we run map box, we can get the density of the unique part of the map. So in our GROEL example, we get a file that only contains the density for this orange part of that big blue map. And the reason why we want to do this is that it's much easier to build a model into this small map instead of this blue map. And so this leads to the next step, which is model build building atomic model that fits the cry map. And so we have roughly two possibilities. We can do rigid model docking and we can do automated model building. So it's, uh, and we have actually several challenges for automated model building in CryoEM. So one of these cry challenges is that CryoEM samples are large. So this is shown uh, or illustrated by this figure here. We have here models with molecular weight larger than a thousand kilodalton um, deposited in the PDB as a function of the year. And so I have here two bars. The red bars represent X-ray models that were deposited, and the blue bars represent cryoEM uh, structures that were deposited. And you can see that in the uh, last five years, the X-ray structures, large X-ray structures, decrease, but the cryoEM structures increase. So we have more and more really huge cryoEM structures, and so it will. It's uh, difficult to automatically build. Uh, something into very large structures. And the second challenge is that the map resolution is typically low. So although it's possible to reach now resolutions between one and two angstrom, uh, typically map resolutions for in cryoEM are between three and five. 
So the challenges are how to interpret these featureless maps and how to build and optimize models with these uh, data. Now the first possibility to get a model into a map is docking. And the idea here is to place an existing model into a map. So we use this model as a rigid body. So here we have an example, we have a map and we have a model that fits maybe into one part of that map. And the idea is to not do this maybe in a molecular viewer, which is um, very fiddly and time consuming, but have a program which will do this automatically. So mapped, the model docking will do a systematic search of rotations and translations of this um, model. This search is performed in reciprocal space because it's fast. And once we have an initial position, we can do a rigid body optimization of that position. And ideally, at the end, we will get a model that has been docked into the map. So this is still the, the exact same configuration of the initial model. So the side chains have not been moved or the domain, the, these two uh, pieces here, they're not hinged together or anything. It's just a rigid model uh, docking and movement. So this is how we run rigid model docking. So the program is called doc in map and we use, a, uh, we need a map file and a search model and the resolution. And the final result will be a model that has been docked into the map. And this can be further used uh, for refinement or um, subsequent steps. So if there is no initial model available, it is necessary to build a model from scratch by only using the map. And for this, we do model building. This is map to model. And so uh, there is a paper describing the procedure, but uh, Tom, who is developing this tool, he made um, several improvements in the past couple of months or in the past uh, couple of years. And so I will describe the current um, state of the art of the model building tool. So the approach is to trace the chain the way a person does. So let's say if we have a map and we want to see how that map looks like, we typically watch out first for secondary structure. And so that's also what the tool will do. In the, the algorithm will first try to find secondary structure and clear regions of density. So here on the right, you can see some density in pale yellow and in um, gray. And this looks very much like a helix, so we can place a helix in there. Once we are confident about these two helices, we can start trying to find some density that connects these helices. So we adjust the contour level until a region just connects to another. So until we just get this density here that connects the two helices which we had here in the top. And then we will iterate to uh, this procedure to build up a connected chain. So we get connected density. And once we have this connected density, we can start um, placing actually the actual atoms. And this is how this is done and how we find the C alpha and C beta positions. So once we have this density, we trace a chain path through this density. So we don't even care on where could be atom, atoms be, we just trace a chain path. So we have lots of different, let's say dummy atoms, um, which are probably closer to each other than we expect from bonded atoms. But this all doesn't matter because this is pre preliminary. And once we have that chain path, which sort of represents the main chain, we try to find the C beta positions. So we can see here this protruding density from uh, this chain path, and we are pretty confident that these are probably the C beta positions. So we will place the C beta C represented by the big blue uh, spheres. And once we know where the C beta atoms are, we can move on and uh, place the C alpha atoms because they will be next to the C beta positions. And we also know that the C alpha uh, atoms are on average 3.8 angstrom apart. And 
this will give us um, the um, beginning of a um, polyalanine model. And once we have this polyalanine model, we can construct an all atom model by placing the side chains. And we will do this in this way here. Let's say we want to um, determine what the side chain here in the left part uh, of this map is, where the arrow is. So this is quite a lot of density. So this is probably a quite long side chain. So what the algorithm will do is it will place actually each residue here and refine it into this density and then calculate a correlation coefficient. So for example, for glycine, this correlation coefficient will be pretty low because this is a lot of density and there must be something larger than a glycine or let's say an alanine. So let's look at the um, correlation coefficients where they're actually pretty high. So they're pretty high for phenylalanine and pretty high for histidine or here for, I think that's a tyrosine. So looking at the correlation coefficients alone doesn't give us really the end, uh, the final answer of which residue could be here. So we need some more information and that is obtained by the sequence because we typically know the sequence of um, our uh, sample. So if we know that probably a neighboring at um, residue was a certain type, or if we know how many histidines and phenylalanines are in the structure, uh, are in that sequence, then we can, we can assign a probability um, that will tell us which residue is the most probable at this position. So in this case, the probability is highest for that phenylalanine and not for histidine, which almost had the same correlation coefficient. And so this way we can assign a sequence to the um, model that has been built into the map. So this slide um, shows how the um, procedure improved from the previous version of model building. So we tried to omit, automatically build a model into a 3.3 angstrom map. And the resulting model is shown here in this uh, blue uh, cartoon. So what we can see here is that we have a lot of different fragments that are not really connected. We have maybe some helices here, but if you look at this helix here, well, this looks like the helix is actually connected, but the algorithm did not, um, was not able to make one big helix in this place. So the average chain length using the old algorithm was 13. And with the new algorithm, we get, we get this model here, and here the average chain length is 84. So we get now many more residues that are connected. And for example, if we look again at this helix here, this time we don't have two fragments, but we have one helix, and we can even see how it connects to other parts of the model. So such a model needs hopefully less manual um, intervention after this first automatic procedure. So it not, uh, the new version not only um, gives uh, longer chains, it will also be faster. So this figure shows you the number of residues built as a function of time. In orange, we have version two of map to model and in violet, we have version one. And it's uh, very obvious that version two can build more residues in a shorter amount of time. but it will still uh, take, let's say an hour or maybe even a couple of hours, depending on how many uh, uh, residues have to be built. So here's the GUI for the map to model um, uh, program. So the minimal input is a map file, the resolution limit and the sequence. And hopefully this will be sufficient to be uh, going from a map to a model with, that has been built into the map. So, however, um, this works really well at a higher resolution, but um, the lower the resolution, it will be more and more challenging to get a complete model. So it is expected that there will be still some uh, manual work necessary um, to complete the model building. 
So again, here's the uh, overview uh, slide for the tools for CryEM in Phoenix. Um, today we talked about auto sharpen, about docking and map to model, and we briefly went over map symmetry and map box. And if this was a bit too quick, or you want to see um, some more information about these tools and how to run them, we also have a tutorial channel with uh, videos for uh, the mostly used tools. So let's say auto sharpen and map to model have their own dedicated um, tutorials that explain how to run the tutorial data. So and with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for having me at this uh, SP Grid um, seminar series. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you. We have uh, a few questions already going in the chat and a bit of a discussion. So I'll, I'll pass those on in a second. If anyone else has questions, uh, you can put them into the chat. I believe you can raise your hand and then we can unmute you. Um, there's enough people on the call that we should um, raise your hand and then I'll go and unmute and so we, uh, but then you can ask your question and we can discuss. So first off, I think people were, um, were talking about the differences between Phoenix's approach in the sharpening and say rely on or, um, and I got an email from someone else who's asking about free aligning. The, um, the differences between the method that you know, Phoenix would use as opposed to um, optimal sharpening determined by other programs. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like what? Yeah, I, I'm sorry because I actually don't know how other programs do the sharpening, so I cannot really comment on that. Um, so I can cannot say what the different approaches are. If the question is what would be the best best method, I would always say uh, try probably as many programs as uh, you know how to use them. Um, that can never be. Sometimes one program can give a better result than another one that depends on all the um, default values. So I, I'm sure that in the end, programs will have, a, no matter which program will be able to get a very clear map, but sometimes it's just not clear which um, parameters we need. Yeah, I um, so related questions. Could you um, talk about, um, things like nucleic acids or ligands or how those might uh, affect model building in the, uh, in the map to model? Okay, so in map to model, um, it will, uh, I didn't talk about this, but um, I think at one point it will also try to do, distinguish between um, amino acid residues and between nucleic acids. So it will try to build this and hopefully there will be also some sequence information about that. Um, about ligands, this decision is not made. So if there's something, if there's a big ligand in, in, in the map, and if the density is visible and clear, probably there might be some, um, something built into there which doesn't belong. Um, so let's say it's not possible to give map to model the information of, I have such and such ligand in there, please build it for me. So that is uh, not yet possible. Uh, how about lipids? So that's, you know, someone asked specifically about my cells, but that's something, you know, in crystallographic maps, we don't, we don't run into the lipids very often. In CryoEM, that's a little more common. Yeah, I'm also not aware that it's possible as of now to automatically build lipids. So anything which is not protein or not nucleic acid, Will have will need require a manual uh, attention. So we'll have to look at the map, make sure that something has not built into that density. Uh, let's say if it's lipid density, that nothing else has been built into the into it, and if no density has been put there, then you have to place that lipid um, manually. Could you could you comment on resolution? Like where where do you think you're seeing the sort of cut off or would, it wouldn't be useful to use this approach or is this something you can do with say a seven angstrom map a five angstrom map you mean map to model i think from both uh both uh perspectives actually from the sharpening and the uh map to model but i think okay. this question was maybe specifically for map to model but okay so map to model um i guess 
anything which is lower than five angstrom will be very difficult. So I would not expect uh, too much. Um, between four and five, I guess it depends on how clear the map is. It, it's still able to build something, but it might require more uh, manual uh, model building and rebuilding after that. And I guess everything better than three might actually work quite well. Now for sharpening, um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's really, well, we want to see more details. So if the initial map is already very low resolution, let's say 10 angstrom, I don't think there can be much done in uh, sharpening. So again, I would maybe around five angstrom, six angstrom would be the limit to um, get really uh, striking results. For um, disordered regions, does the map sharpening benefit from masking those? Should you deal with those separately? If you know you have regions that are just um, disordered, and I guess this touches on the issue of sort of local sharpening within these maps. I mean, if there's Region, regions of your map that are well ordered and are, have great density and then you have regions that aren't so great. How does that affect the process? Um, okay, so uh, yeah, this might affect the map sharpening, but what you could do is actually um, combine uh, these focused maps. So I didn't talk about this tool, but there's a tool in Phoenix called Combined Focused Maps so you can do your uh, reconstructions for the different areas and get the best map for these areas, combine them, and then you can do the sharpening on that. So probably that would be the best approach if there's a really a lot of difference between the different parts of the map. Uh, one question here, if, could, could you comment on cryo fit? If uh, this, uh, this person has a low res map, and they were wondering if it's a better option than map to model. Um, okay, that all depends. So I will just go to that map to model slide to just make sure. Yeah, so map to model it does rigid model docking. So as I said, it will, for example, these two, um, let's say domains, which are connected, they will not move with respect to each other. What CryoFit tries to do, it will be allow some flexibility. And this might be especially useful if there is some difference in, in the um, arrangement of these domains between the search model and the map. So if you think that is happening, then definitely cryofit is uh, worth a try. So uh, version two, is that available now? Is that in the, um, I saw yep. it. RC6 is the most recent version of 1.18 RC6, I think came out a couple of days ago. So we're, we're waiting for 1.18, but I think it's still in the release candidate stage. Yes, yeah, so it's still a release candidate. Um, so yeah, that's currently available. I think it's also available in 1.17. Okay. So it's more about um, if, if you want to have the very latest um, density modification um, tools, then you would need the release candidate. But I think map to model um, has been changed um, already a while ago. Yep. So that uh, if anyone on the call is wants 1.18 RC6, it is available now. And if you drop me an email, I can make sure you get it. Um, uh, so uh, one second. Can you discuss a situation where a molecular dynamics based approach um, would be preferred? I think you were talking a little bit about low res maps earlier, but I think this is again sort of comparing the map to model versus a sort of flexible fitting approach? Um, again, I would say maybe if we are in this gray zone of maybe 4.5 and lower maps, but then it, I guess it all depends. Sometimes it works at 4.5, sometimes it doesn't. So if, if, I would, if I had a map in this gray zone, I would just try both methods. Uh, we had a couple of questions about symmetry, just uh, mm -hmm. why, why you would choose to segment the map rather than relying on um, NCS uh, constraints or um, providing an input that contains symmetry operators. Um, okay, so um, the, uh, when we want to get the unique part of the map, 
that's um, for model building. So in model building, it would make, um, it will slow down the process. So it's faster to build something small and then we will actually apply the symmetry again to reconstruct a model for the whole thing here, for the whole map, and then we will refine the whole model. So I was um, probably not complete here. So we will, uh, for model building, it's faster to use the small map, and then we will go back to the um, full um, molecule when you do a fine map. Great. So we had quite a few questions in here. If I missed your question, I apologize. You can uh, either raise your hand and you can ask it yourself or you can uh, paste it back in there. We had quite a few come by at the same time, so I apologize if I overlooked it. Um, you can always uh, write emails to um, phoenix, help at phoenix-online. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the email address is on our web page, so you can write us an email and um, we can answer your questions. We're happy to help. Great. Well, thank you very much. I urge everybody on the call who <clears throat> is interested in giving this a try. I've, I've mentioned this before, but I think that the Phoenix tutorials that are just built in with test data that you can just run and try the tools out, I think um, that's great. It's a great place for people to get started. And uh, I would urge people to take advantage of that. And um, if you want the latest and greatest uh, in your installation, you can drop us an email uh, at uh, bugs at spgrid.org. Again, Dorothy, thank you. It was really yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Great. Take care, everyone. Bye.